Reading Comprehension Passage C, Learning to Love Volatility. Several years before the financial crisis descended on us, I put forward the concept of a black swan, which are large events that are both expected and highly consequential. We never see black swans coming, but when they do arrive, they profoundly shape our world. Think of World War I, 9-11, the internet, and the rise of Google. In economic life and history more generally, just about everything of consequence comes from black swans. Ordinary events have paltry, let's see what that means, insignificant. Ordinary events have insignificant effects in the long term. Still, through some mental bias, people think in the hindsight that they sort of consider the possibility of such events. This gives them confidence in continuing to formulate predictions. But our tool for forecasting and risk measurement cannot begin to capture a black swan. Indeed, our faith in these tools make it more likely that we will take, continue to take dangerous, uninformed risks. Some made the mistake of thinking that I hope to see us develop better methods for predicting black swans. Others asked if we should just give up and throw our hands in the air. If we cannot measure the risks of potential blowups, where, what were we to do? The answer is simple. We should try to create institutions that won't fall apart when we encounter black swans, or that might even gain from these unexpected events. Fragility is the quality of things that are vulnerable to volatility. Take the coffee cup on your desk. It wants peace and quiet because it incurs more harm than benefit from random events. The opposite of fragile, therefore, isn't robust or sturdy or resilient. Things with these qualities are simply difficult to break. <clears throat> to deal with black swans, we instead need things that gain from volatility, variability, stress, and disorder. My admittedly inelegant term for this crucial quality is anti-fragile. The only existing expression remotely close to the concept of anti-fragility is what we derivative traders, what the heck is that? They're professionals who work buying and selling stock options, futures, and other contracts. So it's a Wall Street dude. Anti-fragility is what we Wall Street dudes call long gamma to describe financial packages that benefit from market volatility. Crucially, both fragility and anti-fragility are measurable. As a practical matter, emphasizing anti-fragility means that our private and public sectors should be able to thrive and improve in the face of disorder. By grasping the mechanisms of anti-fragility, we can make better decisions without the illusion of being able to predict the next big thing. We can navigate situations in which the unknown predominates and our understanding is limited. However, there are five policy rules that can help us to establish anti-fragility as a principle of our socioeconomic life. Rule number one, think of the economy as being more like a cat than a washing machine. We are victims of the post-enlightenment view that the world functions like a sophisticated machine to be understood like a textbook, engineering problems and run by wonks. Wonks are experts. In other words, like a home appliance, not like the human body. If this were so, our, my, our institutions would have no self-healing properties and would need someone to run and micromanage them to protect their safety because they cannot survive on their own. By contrast, natural or organic systems are anti-fragile. They need some dose of disorder in order to develop. Deprive your bones of stress and they become brittle. This denial of the antifragility of living or complex systems is the costliest mistake that we have made in modern times. Stifling natural fluctuations masks real problems, causing the explosions to be both delayed and more intense when they do take place. As with the flammable material accumulating on the forest floor in the absence of forest fires, Problems hide in the absence of stressors, and the resulting cumulative harm can take on tragic proportions. Rule two, favor businesses that benefit from their own mistakes, not those whose mistakes percolate into the system. Some businesses and political systems respond to stress better than others. 
The airline industry is set up in such a way as to make travel safer after every plane crash. A tragedy leads to a thorough examination and elimination of the cause of the problem. The same thing happens in a restaurant industry, where the quality of your next meal depends on the failure rate in this business. What kills some make others stronger. Without the high failure rate in the restaurant business, you would be eating Soviet-style cafeteria food for your next meal out. These industries are anti-fragile. The collective enterprise benefits from the fragility of the individual components, so nothing fails in vain. These businesses have properties similar to evolution in the natural world. With a well-functioning mechanism to benefit from evolutionary pressures, one error at a time. Rule three, small is beautiful, but it's also efficient. Experts in business and government are always talking about the economies of scale. They say that increasing the size of projects and institutions brings cost savings. But efficient, when too large, isn't so efficient. Size produces visible benefits, but also hidden risks. It increases exposure to the probability of large losses. Projects of 100 million seem rational, but they tend to have a much higher percentage overruns than projects of say 10 million. Great size in itself, when it exceeds a certain threshold, produces fragility and can eradicate all the gains from the economies of scale. To see how large things can be fragile, consider the difference between an elephant and a mouse. The former breaks a leg at the slightest fall while the later is unharmed by a drop several multiples of its height. This explains why we have so many more mice than elephants. Rule number four, trial and error beats academic knowledge. Things that are anti-fragile love randomness and uncertainty, which also means crucially that they can learn from errors. Tinkering by trial and error has traditionally played a larger role than directed science in Western invention and innovation. Indeed, advances in theoretical science have most often emerged from technological development, which is closely tied to entrepreneurship. That means the business of developing new businesses and owning new businesses. Just think of the number of famous college dropouts in the computer industry. I don't mean just any version of trial and error. There is a crucial requirement to achieve anti-fragility. The potential cost of errors needs to remain small. The potential gain should be large. It is the asymmetry between upside and downside that allows anti-fragile tinkering to benefit from disorder and uncertainty. America has emulated this earlier model. In the invention of everything from cybernetics to pricing formulas for derivatives. Cybernetics is stuff that with computers. So the invention of everything from something with computers to the pricing formulas for derivatives, which is that Wall Street thing. They were developed by practitioners in trial and error mode, drawing continuous feedback from reality. To promote anti-fragility, we must recognize that there is an inverse relationship between the amount of formal education that a culture supports and its volume of trial and error by tinkering. Innovation doesn't require theoretical instruction, what I like to compare to lecturing birds on how to fly. Rule five, decision makers must have skin in the game. At no time in the history of humankind have more positions of power been assigned to people who don't take personal risks. But the idea of incentive in capitalism demands some comparable form of disincentive. In the business world, the solution is simple. Bonuses that go to managers whose firms subsequently fail should be clawed back. And there should be additional financial penalties for those who hide risks under the rug. This has an excellent precedent. A precedent is an established example. This has an uh, excellent example in the practice of the ancients. The Romans forced engineers to sleep under the bridge once it was completed. Because our current system is so complex, it lacks elementary clarity. No regulator will know more about the hidden risk of an enterprise 
than the engineer who can hide exposure to the rare events and be unharmed by their consequence. This rule would have saved us from the banking crisis when bankers who loaded their balance sheets with exposure to small probability events collected bonuses during the quiet years and then transferred the harm to the taxpayer, keeping their own compensation. So in these five rules, I have sketched out only a few of the more obvious policy conclusions that we might draw from a proper appreciation of anti-fragility. But the significance of anti-fragility runs deeper. It's not just a useful heuristic, heuristic formula. It's not just a use, useful formula for socioeconomic matters, but a crucial property of life in general. Things that are anti-fragile only grow and improve under adversity. This dynamic can be seen not just in economic life, but in the evolution of all things, from cuisine, urbanization, and legal systems, to our own existence as a species on this planet. This is from Nassim Nicholas Talib from Learning to Love Volatility in the Wall Street Journal, November 16th, 2012. Number 15, the author believes that black swans in line two are one, used to anticipate failures, two, unimportant setbacks, three, unpredictable occurrences, four, used to guarantee benefits. 16. What is the tone of lines 15 and 16? One, insistent. Two, sarcastic. Three, reverent. Four, pessimistic. 17. The reference to long gamma in line 24 serves to one, introduce a political theory, Two, provide a relevant example. Three, oppose a previous argument. Four, support a scientific proposal. 18, it can be inferred from lines 38 through 44 that stressors, one, should be seen as signals of faulty systems. Two, can be expected to occur in predictable cycles. Three, must be carefully managed to avoid instability. Four, should be viewed as opportunities to improve performance. 19, lines 45 through 51 contribute to a central idea by emphasizing the one, role of the government in quality management, two, dismissal of progressive practices, three, importance of setbacks to industry success, four, consequences of ignoring standards. Number 20, rule three suggests the most efficient way to manage projects is to one, have an economic plan, two, resist unnecessary growth, three, encourage fragile economics, four, revise corporate regulation. 21, as used in line 76, the word emulate, emulated, most nearly means one, imitated, two, discredited, three, accelerated, four, ignored. 22, the comparison drawn in lines 80 through 82 illustrates that invention one can be instinctive, two, relies on education, three, can be rigid, four, depends on technology. Number 23, the phrase clawed back, lines 86, implies that some managers, one, are intolerant of traditional rules, two, should be open to constructive criticism, three, are wary of unconventional ideas, four, should be accountable for careless decisions. And 24, which statement best reflects a central idea about disorder? One, things that are anti-fragile love randomness and uncertainty, which also means crucially that they can learn from errors, lines 66 and 67. Two, 
There is a crucial requirement to achieve anti-fragility. The potential cost of errors needs to remain small. The potential gain should be large. Line 72 through 74. Three, at no time in the history of humankind have more positions of power been assigned to people who don't take personal risks. Line 83 and 84. Four, no regulator will know more about the hidden risk of an enterprise than the engineer who can hide exposures to rare events. Lines 90 through 92.